Give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money. So I recently got back into Kim Possible after over a decade of never having given it a second thought. I loved this show as a kid, but until now I'd never actually seen all of it because Canadian broadcasting in the 2000s was a complete pile of ass. See, on Canadian cable, unless you pay a really high premium, you get stuck with syndication reruns on bootleg channels. Instead of Cartoon Network, we had Teletoon. Instead of the Disney Channel, we had the Family Channel. Instead of Nickelodeon, we have YTV. That's why my Top 20 Childhood Cartoons has so many entries that make people go, what the fuck? Lily, where did you find these things? Canada's where I found them. Enough reflection. Anyway, as is typical of me these days, upon rediscovering Kim Possible, I immediately did a horrible thing and looked for other people's takes on the show. Now, there was some gross shit in there, which for the sake of my mental health, I'm not going to unpack today, but the big one I saw was that some people seemed to be under the impression that Ron stole the spotlight on Kim Possible because most of the later episodes and even the finale involved him stepping up, so to speak. Hi, I'm also here. If you say Kim Possible three times to an empty TV, I appear to collect your soul. For those who don't know, me i'm i love kim possible a lot and i do videos too woo go subscribe yeah or I, uh, uh, kp we we don't uh we don't do that here you don't then how do you get people to subscribe uh i don't know make good content trust in the good taste of the viewer you feeling okay there? It's wishful thinking, KP, not a virus. Just get on with your intro. Please really subscribe. Anyway, Kim Possible, the character, is a good character. I mean it. Have you seen this mess? I don't keep it because I don't know how to spell. Well, I don't know how to spell, but the point still stands. I also feel that Kim blends into her setting because on the surface, we've seen the ex-girl having hard high school social pressures trope that Kim just seems like she's following a set trend versus standing out on her own and having her own interpretation of, you know, high school. So I think a lot of people take it for granted that she's a little bit more complex than that. Now, I love boneheaded takes like this because not only are they extremely easy to debunk, but they're also takes that can be taken at face value by a lot of casual viewers. And this means that once it is debunked, the casual viewer gets a new appreciation for the work as a whole that'll usually warrant a second viewing. And as much as I love tearing down garbage works made by garbage people, I love reinvigorating someone's love for a good show even more. So Kim Possible is a show that has two main running tracks at all times, Kim's super spy saving the world missions and her home life. The main central gimmick of the show is that Kim is a hyper-competent super spy who frequently foils the plans of would-be mad scientists and people who psychiatrists all over the world would pay out the nose to study with such frequency and such universal success that it no longer registers as an event to her. But because a show where the main character goes unchallenged by the plot would be boring, in her home life, Kim is a socially anxious basket case whose reputation for overachieving has put her under an unbelievable amount of pressure. On missions, Kim is relaxed and easygoing, sure, but back at home and at school, she often fumbles more than anyone could imagine. In fact, she struggles so badly that her reputation as a world hero barely even registers to most people there, because they already know Kim as that girl who willingly hangs out with that nacho freak. In spite of her supposed popularity, Kim doesn't actually have any real friends beyond on Ron and Monique. To give credit where it's due, the live action movie focuses on Kim being an absolute loser, that even Monique, her only other friend in the show, is written out so Kim can be as vulnerable as possible for the plot. Most of Kim's growth as a character typically centers on her home life and the pressure she's put under. It's easy to dismiss this as a joke, like, oh, she can save the world, but can she find a date for the prom? <laughs> She's got one of the best teams in the business. A look, the sidekick. But nothing could prepare her for this drama. Disney's Kim Possible movie, So the Drama. But the truth of the matter is that Kim's entire central gimmick as a character is that she's an overachiever. She's a straight-A student, manages more clubs and school functions than you could imagine, is head of the cheerleading squad, and is technically one of the most popular students in school. It's easy to dismiss high school drama as not worth dealing with, but when you're the one neck deep in it, then it becomes a lot harder to ignore. You make my life sound like cake. Let's see, you're smart, athletic, pretty, and popular. Sounds pretty cakey to me. Oh. Not only does Kim regularly save the world, which is technically harder than
in dealing with all of this, but her parents are a brain surgeon and a rocket scientist, two of the hardest professions imaginable, and her brother's a super scientist that could give way to run for their money. Not to mention, her family's motto is anything's possible for a possible. Her own tagline is, I can do anything. It's not hard to see just how much unbearable pressure Kim is under every single hour of every single day. I never choke, ever. Check the motto, I can do anything. Right, you can do anything, including fail. See the logic? Kim has a hard time accepting failure or even accepting the notion that she can't actually do everything. Her entire arc throughout the show involves her cracking under pressure or her insecurities about her home life being a massive gaping weakness for her. When Kim fails, she takes it personally. When she's outdone by someone else, she can't handle it. When she has to get pulled out of the fire by Ron, she views it as a failing in and of itself, at least until season four, where she sees it as impossibly romantic. There's an episode in season one where Kim's world saving gets in the way of her status as head cheerleader and Bonnie starts trying to usurp her. When it becomes it's clear that circumstance will result in her losing her position as cheer captain, she concedes to Bonnie. But then she makes it clear to her just how much work is involved in being cheer captain, which takes the wind out of Bonnie's sails considerably. Bonnie, you're the captain now. You do realize that the hard work is just beginning. You're kidding, right? You know, suddenly, I couldn't be happier for you. Captain Bonnie? I've gotta keep working hard. This is so unfair. All this teen drama bullshit? Yeah, it's work. It's an inordinate amount of work. Compare this to Ron, who doesn't have any of these pressures in his life. His parents are a banker and an actuary, respectively, and his own life is rather laid back and he coasts through school. His aspirations are low, but so is his lifestyle. He's just vibing most of the time, and he's the only one who approaches the missions with any degree of panic. It's on missions where he needs to learn to step up and do something other than be a perpetual fuck-up. And it tends to be where Kim is concerned where Ron shows most of his own struggles. It's generally shown that without Ron with her on missions, Kim tends to struggle a lot more because Ron's contributions are more frequent than one would realize. Kim even says that she couldn't save the world without him, and splitting them up with Shigo's entire gambit in a in time. His friendship with Kim is the most precious thing to him, so precious in fact that it can often lead to him making some really boneheaded decisions, like an emotion sickness, where during Kim's tech-induced love sickness, he ruminates on the fact that if a romantic relationship tanks, then it could potentially ruin their friendship, so he gets the boneheaded idea to tank it faster, because that won't, apparently? I think their relationship approach for So the Drama holds its ground when compared to what happened to emotion sickness, is that Ron's jealousy tends to realize he wants Kim in his life more than a friend, because he feels something is wrong when they aren't close anymore. In emotion sickness, Ron is calling the shots, so he drowns in his influence a little bit. The point is that the show is about both of them, and the notion that the show is more about Ron completely ignores everything that happens in the damn show. Hell, it ignores the big game-changing movie that most people remember. Kim's insecurities about status and school hierarchies is pretty much the central plot of So the Drama. It's what the entire storyline hinges on. Kim is doing just fine and nothing is wrong until Bonnie starts digging into her head about who she's going to take to junior prom. And then suddenly the very thing she dismissed not five seconds ago becomes a problem because now she's fretting about her image. For the first time ever, she questions whether or not saving the world is a bad thing because it might be weirding guys out to see her beating up henchmen. What if there is something wrong with me, Monique? Because you're not dating a quarterback? I'm weirding guys out. They see me on TV, roundhousing some goon out a window. It's a vivid image. Kim, you are a strong, independent woman. Any brother afraid of that is not worthy of your time. And this is her getting worked up and worried about something she can't actually control. Some men are so painfully insecure that even just the knowledge that their girlfriend could beat them in a fight will make them uncomfortable. That's toxic masculinity and systemic sexism at play. Bonnie has, with just a few words, caused Kim to spiral down into internalized misogyny that only her only female friend can pull her out of. That's how easy it is to tug on Kim's strings. I mean, a date date would be nice. A stinking BF. You're letting Bonnie play you. Am not. What good is saving the world if you don't have someone to share it with? Okay, a little. Kim later has a similar conversation with her mother, proving that when left to her own devices, she'll still end up letting Bonnie play her, even when literally everyone around her is telling her that it's not a big deal. Her parents try to make it clear to her that it's not a big deal, and considering their professions, they were clearly nerds in high school. They weren't at the top of the food chain that Kim is fretting over, and look where they are now. Kim struggles to accept that Bonnie is completely full of shit because she's so obsessed with her image that it is her biggest weakness. Kim can put aside her petty bullshit when the entire world is on the line, but when it's not, 
not, that's when the petty bullshit becomes a problem. Her world saving and hero work for the most part remain completely separate so that she can always step away and approach her world saving with a clear head. Problem is that Draken has gotten wise to this. He's remembered that Kim is a young woman with a personal life and now he's targeting that to hamstring her effectiveness at stopping him. Just as Kim might start thinking that going to the prom with Ron won't be a big deal, in walks Eric, Draken's distraction. He arrives at the exact moment to start playing on Kim's desperation to find a partner at the top of the food chain and keep her distracted while he goes about his plans. As the second act of the film carries on, you're watching Kim be essentially gaslit by someone whose only purpose is to manipulate her. He even convinces her to ignore Wade, who she never ignores the first time he calls. If you're keeping track, this is probably the most toxic and actual villain-like thing Draken ever becomes. And the reason Kim underestimates him is this is the guy she literally wins battles with one move. And not even the audience takes him seriously half the time, because a good chunk of the appeal with Draken is either his banter with Shigo or his general being an idiotness. Him being a serious threat is solely based on his needs to be successful. Heck, he's introduced as a character in this film by being a self-conscious basket case. So he's at the end of his rope and really, really needs to buckle down. And here's the kicker. If it hadn't been for Ron making a stink about bendy straws, Draken would have won. This is most likely true. I wouldn't mind seeing a fan fiction where Draken has the edge and so the drama and Kim has to backtrack in order to save the world. But can she save the world from her biggest enemy, herself? Daunt, daunt, da. I fucking love having you here. By the time of the big reveal where Kim is suited up and gone full on of a Dark Flare rage mode, the realization that she had been completely and totally played crushes her spirit in totality. She loses all hope and even starts believing she should have stuck to babysitting all those years ago, and is only pulled out of it once Ron finally up and confesses his feelings to her. There are guys out there that are better for you than Eric. Gu guys that are real for one thing. You really think there's a guy out there for me? Out there? in here. Oh. Really? And that has long-lasting effects on Kim's character for the rest of the series. Her insecurities and fussing about her image almost got her killed. It got her hurt in one of the worst ways possible, and she never lets that happen again. Hell, the very first episode of season four has Bonnie pulling the exact same garbage she did in So the Drama. So are you two, like, still together? Yes, Bonnie. I mean, I know things got noxious at the junior prom, but you had all summer to come to your senses. So have you. But it also means <laughs> you must date a jock. It's... it's non-optional. It's like a rule. Ron's the exception to the rule. Hmm. He's the reason for the rule. Only this time, Kim isn't biting because once you get gaslit by a goo monster sent by one of your enemies and realize what it means to have someone who actually cares about you, you tend not to be as susceptible to the same garbage trash. It's actually Ron who gets insecure this time around. Which is actually understandable because Kim has been known in the past to obsess over her status. Kim is probably the most stable main character in the fourth season. And because of this, much of the plot is dependent on situations that present themselves or character arcs with Ron accepting himself and Chigo and Chigo and Jacken with each other. As season four is a little weird because Kim's arc effectively came to a close once she got a handle on her self-image issues. She's with someone she cares about, which was ultimately what she wanted in So the Drama, and is no longer concerned about status regarding who she's with because ultimately real love and real happiness will beat that instinct down like it's moles in an arcade machine. And Bonnie's insistence on maintaining the status quo ultimately fails to make any connection because even trying to do that achieved nothing but getting Kim hurt, and Kim's patience with Bonnie ultimately evaporates by this point. Later in the season, Bonnie makes the mistake of messing with the one thing you should never mess with. Ron. It's worth pointing out that in a deleted scene of So the Drama, Ron suggests that Kim just kick Bonnie's ass because, you know, she can. People often forget that Kim is extremely strong and extremely skilled and could beat down most people in a brawl. So if she really wanted to hurt Bonnie, she could, and nobody would really blame her for it. Kim writes it off as an irresponsible use of her strength and that she's better than that. Well, when Bonnie kisses Ron in season four, Kim is so fucking angry that it looks for a moment like she might beat Bonnie into a pulp. And even Wade and Ron are watching and wondering if this really is just going to be the last straw for her. Even Bonnie slowly comes to the realization of who exactly she's been antagonizing this entire time. What is the six? Hey, I was the kissy here, not the kisser! No kidding! It took you 12 stinking years to kiss me! I don't know what you're up to, but this is a new low, even for you. Oh yeah? Well, speaking of low, which I am, you, you're... Well... Well, well, I... 
It's a moment of real character growth for Kim because she never once suspects that Ron has been cheating on her. When Ron tries to defend himself by saying he had nothing to do with it, Kim writes that off as a given and immediately rounds on Bonnie. The sheer contempt she has for Bonnie at this point is palpable, and we see this girl go from the biggest thorn in Kim's side to a pathetic wretch who Kim is long past the point of even giving the time of day. It gets reinforced again in the final episode where Kim is accepted to high-profile colleges all around the world while Bonnie has to do summer school. That's a lot of character growth to just write off as not existing just because it barely takes place during the missions. Bonnie herself is hinted to be the insecure one, having to use the Ron kiss as a desperate plea to get Kim's help to not be forever alone. Something I don't think people remember that often is this clip from season three. I got all the brains. I got all the looks. And Bonnie got the rest. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, nothing. Not that it gives her excuse to be a shitty human being, but it makes sense why Bonnie would just hone in on Kim all the fucking time. So why did this happen? Well, the thing is that Kim Possible had a mixed gender demographic. Boys and girls like this show. And in terms of the early 2000s, Kim Possible was practically feminist. Hell, it actually, it still is. And, well... Here's the thing about early 2000s feminism. It was predominantly about pushing back against media portrayals of women as dainty wallflowers. And the thing about any reactionary pushback is that it will inevitably make a number of bad takes in its path. We all talked about this before, and that oftentimes a pro-feminist character is little more than a female character action hero written with all the emotionally stunted macho bullshit of tired tropes surrounding male characters and is completely absent of anything that might be perceived as traditionally feminine. Hell, oftentimes a lazy shortcut to creating pro-feminist characters is to just abstain from a love interest and make them into hardened badasses because feelings are for girls. Starting to see the problem? The thing about Kim Possible is that she isn't that kind of character. She never has been. She's empathetic, sensitive to the feelings of others, into traditional girly things outside of her world saving, and most of her story involves her fretting over things like dances, clubs, mixers, her look, and the prom. And as a result, there was an effort, perhaps unconsciously, to ignore or filter out that entire half of the show and only focus on the action and the villains, which in all honesty were the B-plot of the show most of the time. Just casually ignore the rest of the show because it might be embarrassing if you're a preteen in the early 2000s being told that girly stuff is lame. Plus, underplaying that social constructs in our society also have a very damning effect on any individual's development. The reason why many people don't speak about their trauma based in some social aspects is because they're afraid it will be dismissed as petty and not worth people's time. Stop doing that. Bad internet. Just a reminder, I know most people trash the remake because now it's different and I can't handle that, and I get it, Kim Possible definitely works better as a cartoon for a lot of reasons. Mostly a good chunk of the jokes and general atmosphere that would work in a cartoon just come off as cheap in live action. That's why most cartoons turn live action focus on using bright colors and recognizable imagery to solely focus on the media change and hopefully bring that tone with them. Worked for George the Jungle. Anyway, the fatal flaw with the live action movie is that instead of focusing on the world saving as something Kim does, it makes it how she defines herself. And without it, she doesn't know who she is. For those playing at home, Maui has a similar arc in Moana. To be fair, based on what we know about Kim and just teenage girls in general, that's a fair and I think a little underrated interesting take on Kim as a character. Why it doesn't work though, is that it implies that Kim is just saving the world as an ego boost and, you know, not because it's the right thing to do, which underlines and calls into question how selfless she is. Is she really a hero if the definition of a hero generally is pretty selfless? That's kind of what they do and help their general relatability. I think for me, I personally have had my relationship with the show defined and redefined as a age. Yay, aging. Looking back, it's defined everything from my taste in music via AMVs, my understanding of the industry, as well as providing a path for exactly what I am doing in the future and now. For those who just can't get over MLP ending, this whole video exists to show that these characters aren't dead, the show's just over, it's just different. Kim is an amazing character in her own right, and one of the reasons I actively refuse to change my ridiculous name is because I'm still actively defined by its influence. KP is like my personal cartoon Jesus. I've never found a problem relating to Kim because of how seemingly obvious her sh shortcomings were to me, which makes her more relatable. But this is something you might have not actively paid attention to when you're watching it as a child. And it really does hold up if you feel like a rewatch. What good media can do is not only entertain, but also shape us into who we can be. And Kim Possible did that for me. She might just do it for you too. Kim Possible is a show that hasn't just aged well. It's arguably the best animated show ever made. And Kim's arc as a character is the main reason it's held up so well. You know, along with the clever writing, enjoyable antagonist, delightfully written romance, and the best quality animation ever seen in a cartoon that never once had to cut corners to look amazing. We cover a lot of bad shows on this show, but Kim Possible is truly the best ever made. And if you take the time to pay attention to everything, rather than just looking at the gadgets, laughing at Ron's funny antics, and ogling Shigo, there's something genuinely enriching there. Is it going to change your life and broaden your horizons? 
Probably not, but it'll be something you remember and hold close to you for a long time. I promise you, in 15 years, there will not be a channel named I Love Steven Universe a lot. <laughs>